kneel before Zod. You can't go. All the plants are gonna die. I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil. Don't touch it. The name's Pliskin. No war Hang on! Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're re-watching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we'll be discussing The French Lieutenant's Woman, released September 18th, 1981. It was written by Harold Pinter and Carol Reese, uncredited, based on a novel by John Fowles, directed by Carol Reese, and released by United Artists. John Fowles' novel, The French Lieutenant's Woman, was published in 1969. It came with three endings, which we'll discuss at the end. The story started with the quintessential Victorian woman character of Sarah Woodruff, and Fowles credits authors like Thomas Hardy, who wrote Far From the Madding Crowd, and the novel adapted into Tess last season for the inspiration to the story. The screen rights were picked up right away by Lester Goldsmith the same year it was published. Boys from Brazil and Sphinx director Franklin J. Schaffner was quickly attached to direct, for a budget of around $4 million, with an expected start date of spring 1973. Obviously that didn't happen, because this film came out eight years later. Ultimately, director Schaffner and attached writer James Goldman made a determination that the story was unfilmable, and MGM wiped the film from its slate. Producer Goldsmith approached Willy Wonka producer David L. Wolper with plans for an NBC miniseries that also never happened. 20th Century Fox briefly wound up with the rights, but also found it unadaptable. Now, was this, like, original story just the, like, story within a story yes. version of it? Okay, that the makes more sense to me. stuff with the actors is added to this version of the story. Yeah, like some sort of pastoral drama, Correct. just period piece straight up. Yes, okay. but it came with three endings at the end of the story that yeah. you could basically choose which ending you liked. I, and I could totally see that being a miniseries, you know, or... Or something like and each night would end and, the yeah. different way. Yeah. yeah. In '75, director Fred Zinnemann bought the book rights and set up a deal at Paramount. Dennis Potter composed a satisfactory script. I, I would like to see the Dennis Potter version, yeah. please. Wait, who's Dennis Potter? I like Dennis Potter because he wrote a series called The Singing Detective, that was adapted multiple times, including the Robert Downey Jr. version, in, including the Robert Downey Jr. version, which is like this. Yeah. Where it's about the movie and the thing being happening simultaneously. Charlotte Rampling was attached to that version to play Sarah Woodruff, but again, pre-production stalled out. Next up to bat was producer Saul Zantz with screenwriter James Costigan, and again, it went nowhere. Finally, in 1978, the rights landed at Warner Brothers, and world-renowned playwright Harold Pinter was entrusted with adapting the novel into a filmable screenplay. At the same time, Carol Reese was attached to direct. Warner considered actresses Julie Christie and Vanessa Redgrave on the way to Meryl Streep, but then suddenly they got cold feet, considering the story's difficult path to the big screen, and put the film in turnaround. United Artists picked up the screen rights and retained the cast and crew assembled to finally set a production start date of May 1980, with Streep locked into the titular role. Pinter's solution to the multiple endings was to add another layer to the story, addressing head-on the difficulty of unconfusingly producing a film with multiple endings to choose from, though I feel like audiences today would be much less thrown by the concept. Yeah, but then did they only do two of the three? Well, technically speaking, there's two endings to the book, but just preceding those two endings is a dream sequence, which could be considered a third ending to the story. Okay. But we'll discuss all that at the end. It's also possible that the release of Clue and Run Lola Run in the interim have made people a little bit more understanding of For sure. how a film could have multiple endings. Yeah. Uh, I think it would have been great to to have had this go to the theaters with three different endings, much like Clue did. Like Clue did, yeah. And, and, and not not in sequentially, yeah. but just have them... Random assigned lead to different theaters. Yeah. That's awesome. On a budget of about $8 million, it went on to a box office take of $24 million and five Oscar nominations for Best Actress, Adapted Screenplay, Art Direction, Costume Design, and Editing. It won none of them, but took home three of its 11 BAFTA nominations. The French Lieutenant's Woman was the second highest grossing film in the UK that year, behind only Chariots of Fire. Hmm. They have better taste than us. 
For context, this film will take place in two layers of reality. We have a present day real world of the film where actors are on a set playing characters and we have the film within the film and we see the lives of the characters in that movie. The first shot is kind of a blend of the two because the camera is already pointed at the set and the crew are preparing a shot to be filmed. The slate is clapped and taken out of frame and we're left in the universe of the film within the film. A woman in a baggy hooded cloak walks up some stone steps to the top of a seawall that we'll come to know as the Cobb and wanders out to where it dead ends into the ocean. Sorry. <laughs> what? In my head I was like, it's corn. <laughs> it has the juice. The camera watches her until she reaches the end and it stops. This is a real landmark in Lyme Regis and the waves on the day of shooting were so tumultuous that rather than allow Streep to walk along the top of this seawall, they dressed the male art director in her cloak and strapped the man to a post at the end of the cob so he wouldn't fall into the sea. Jesus. <laughs> well, yeah, there, I mean, there's a scene later where I was like, that can't be really Jeremy Irons yeah. running out onto that because that's insane. Well, yeah, there is a wide shot of him yeah. where it looks like a wave crashes over it right in front of him. Yeah. Yes. The Cobb also shows up in Jane Austen's novel, Persuasion. So this is in reality called The Cobb. It's called The Cobb, yes. Yeah, like not just in the- And they it, shot it at The Cobb, too. It's not like a recreation of <laughs> oh the my thing. God. Okay. Yeah. So it was legitimately dangerous. Yes, absolutely. We stay in the universe of the film within the film, and we watch a montage of everyday life in the seaside town of Lyme Regis. Is a Lyme Regis like a Orange Julius? Yes, <laughs> but it wants to be a millionaire. That's the difference. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> we end on a close-up of someone chiseling a Nautilus fossil out of a rock. The camera tilts up to reveal Jeremy Irons as Charles Smithson, a scientist of the town, inspecting the fossil with a magnifying glass. He steps to the window and calls down to his assistant Sam, or servant, I guess, and he asks for a carriage to be made ready for a trip to Ernestina's. Ernestina is his fancy fiance. Um, it is Ernestina, right? Ernestina, yeah. Yeah, because sometimes it sounds like people are saying Ernestine. I just wanted to make sure I had that right. Also, is it David or David for her husband's name later? Oh, that I don't, that I don't recall. Okay. Because some people say David, but I but thought I remembered. French. Yeah, mm. I thought I remembered someone saying David, or she said David when she was in bed. Mm. Mr. Smithson asks Ernestina's servant girl, Mary, to announce his arrival. Mr. Charles is here, Miss, to see you. Mr. Charles? He's down below, Miss, waiting for you. He wants to speak to you. Ernestina's very excited to hear of his arrival, seemingly presuming he's here to propose. Mr. Charles heads into the conservatory, which looks like a greenhouse. Ernestina finds him there as their servants, Sam and Mary, watch through a window from the kitchen. He explains expositionally that he arrived from London six weeks ago to study fossils here in Lyme, but the reason he's staying so long is her. Amusingly, he's not even asking her to marry him. He's asking for permission to ask her father's permission to marry her. Yes. But that that's how that goes, technically, back, back in the day. Don't you ask the father first and then ask... The woman? I feel like that's something that happens these days. Because I feel so like it's now, but presumptuous but... of him to ask her for her father's permission before he asked her father to ask her for her father's permission to marry I don't marry think her. he wants to ask the father if she's not interested. Right. I get that. But at this period of time, I don't think it mattered if she was interested or not as long as he had the father's permission. <laughs> hmm. But yeah. she makes the point here. Are you suggesting that it is entirely Papa's decision? No. She gives him her blessing to get her father's blessing. <laughs> Smithson pitches himself as a crusty old scientist and proposes to her without waiting for her father's thoughts on the matter, and she is quick to accept. He holds up a random vine and pretends it's mistletoe as an excuse to kiss her. Now we switch universes to the real world, where Jeremy Irons is now an actor, Mike, lying in bed in a hotel room. The first hint that we're in the present comes in the form of a phone ringing, which he answers. It's the makeup department, and they're calling looking for Anna, who happens to be in bed here with him, played by Meryl Streep. She is late for her call time. Well, because this is, we'll find out that this is her room. Yes. And she's quite upset that he answered the phone. Yes. She realizes that they called the room and he answered, so the secret is out about their relationship. Do you answer the phone? Mm hmm Well, then they know. They know that you're in my room. Mm. He tells her he doesn't care what they think or know, but she's worried she'll be fired from the project for seemingly jumping into bed with her co-star. We cut back to the film within a film, and we see Meryl Streep again, this time as Miss Sarah Woodruff, sitting at the bottom of a flight of stairs drawing in a sketchbook. The illustration looks like a pained bald man. 
As the camera backs away from her, we can see in the foreground that someone is hammering closed the lid of a coffin. The box is carried out to a carriage, and Miss Woodruff is lectured by her landlord. Miss Woodruff, you know you cannot stay here any longer. Miss Duff has made no provision for you in her will. The cottage is to be sold. The man takes pity on her and suggests a job nearby, working as a servant for Miss Pulteney from The Grange. Woodruff is excited when the man confirms that the house overlooks the sea. She takes him up on his gracious offer. The next day, Smithson pays a visit to Mr. Freeman, father of his betrothed. Freeman owns a busy company, which is currently unloading supplies from a ship in the neighboring waterway. When they speak in private, Freeman acknowledges that Smithson is not a rich man, but that he seems upstanding and they shake hands. Mr. Freeman promises an open invitation if Smithson ever intends to join him in the family business, since he has no sons to pass it on to. So, he might as well just set the whole thing on fire. <laughs> it's like, you can't just give it to your daughter? <laughs> Does, doesn't your daughter want to be a free person? Well, I mean, I don't think that women were able to run, you know, a merchant's business at that were point. Were they able to or were they allowed to? They weren't allowed to. <laughs> Have they evolved since then? <laughs> <laughs> We cut to Smithson and his Ernestina on a walk by the water, and he tells her during their meeting that he lectured her father about Darwin's theory just to piss him off. When they climb the stairs up to the seawall, we see the same shot from the beginning of the film. Woodruff stands at the end of the stone pier jutting out into a rough sea. Smithson is concerned for the woman because the waves are crashing hard all around her. Despite his fiancée's objections, he runs across the stones to urge her back to shore. She hears his cries, and when she turns to look at him, they simply stare at each other in silence. We cut to some time later as Smithson and Ernestina discuss the woman. She apparently slept with a French lieutenant, and he left her, and she's been waiting for him ever since. Miss Woodruff arrives at Mrs. Pulteney's house. Mrs. Pulteney reminds me of the old blind woman who hired Tess in that film last season. Yeah, she's like a your classic Dickens-esque yeah. old lady hiring people. Yeah. During the interview process, Pulteney refers to rumors that Miss Woodruff has an attachment to a French person, admitting she doesn't care much for the French, and that Woodruff is often seen on that seawall, the Cobb, staring out to sea. If she is to be hired for this position, she must not behave in this way moving forward. I, I think it feels a little unusual that she would hire her at all with any associations with, you know, connections to a man that she's yeah. not married to. I don't know. I think that this is the kind of lady who likes yelling at people, and she already has a bunch of shit she can yell at this girl about. But I must emphasize that such staring out to sea is provocative, intolerable, and sinful. She asks Miss Woodruff to read from the Bible as a final test of her literacy and acceptable voice quality. Uh, I was very unclear as to what this job was. I, I went into this. My, my last note is, is she some sort of madam? I thought I, I I thought that this was like just a very crazy strict whorehouse, <laughs> and this lady is just you cannot like, look at the ocean. You can only fuck strangers. <laughs> yeah, I was like I was like man, this this, whore, this 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 house of prostitution is very strange and strict. Yeah. Oh, she's being hired as a companion. That's what that's what that's why that's what threw me was oh, the word yeah. companion. Her, her own companion, like come and hang out with me and talk to me and read. Th- from the Bible. And because I can't see it anymore. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think it just triggered because of uh, that the, that's the term for uh, a prostitute in Firefly. Firefly, yeah. Is companion. Mm. We cut to Irons and Streep in the present universe as Mike and Anna laying across a hotel bed. Mike is reading a newspaper and Anna has a book. She reads him a passage about the whore population of 1857 London, which amounted to 80,000 people. At a time when the male population of London, of all ages, was one and a quarter million, the prostitutes were receiving clients at a rate of two million per week. Two million? Yeah. Mike does a bit of back-of-the-envelope calculation. Male population of London was one and a quarter million? Yeah. Well, if we take away a third for children and old men, that means that outside of marriage, your Victorian gentleman could look forward to 2.4 fucks a week. (laughs) We cut back to the film within the film as Professor Smithson hammer and chisels into a cliff face in search of more fossils. Again, this is a real cliff face in Lyme Regis, and the production had to dig out miles and miles of footpaths for the cast to reach this place on foot. He notices Miss Woodruff in a black dress wandering through the nearby woods and spies on her through a telescope. 
He starts to follow her, and we cut to his assistant Sam whistling and skipping down a road with a bouquet of flowers in his hand. This is, it's quite a fancy telescope, too, because when he extends it and looks through it, he can also hear her. <laughs> oh, that's impressive. <laughs> Sam stops to pluck more flowers from the side of a road. Back in the woods, Smithson spies on Miss Woodruff as she lays against a tree and looks out over the ocean again. So sinful. Moving closer, Smithson steps on a twig, calling attention to himself, and startles her. He apologizes and turns to leave, and we cut to the fiancé's home where Sam has arrived with flowers for Ernestina, and Mary, her servant girl, answers the door. The lovely young lady upstairs. Hey, <laughs> For the even more lovely one. <laughs> Sam gifts Mary the road flowers, and she turns to deliver Ernestina's. We cut to Smithson, standing in a barn, drinking a cup of fresh milk squeezed right out of a cow. The <laughs> farmer charges him a penny for it. He watches out the window as Woodruff returns from her perch to the city of Lyme. He asks the farmer who the lady is. She be no lady. She be the French lieutenant's whore. When Mary brings Ernestina her flowers, she is reprimanded for speaking to the servant from London. The card that came with the flowers reads, For My Beloved. Smithson follows Woodruff along a path through the wilderness, and they explain they already know who each other are. She asks repeatedly to be left alone and for Smithson to keep secret that she was ever here. We cut back to the present, but it's confusing for a second because Mike is in character as the professor and addresses Anna as Miss Woodruff. They're also standing in a sunroom that resembles a greenhouse like the one off the back of Ernestina's home. They're running lines with each other here, and Mike seems to have them down, but Anna is shaky. They do the scene a couple times after she screws up the first take, and in the second take, at a point in the scene where her character trips, we cut right to her character tripping in the film within the film. The professor lifts her to standing and asks if he can tell her something, but they hear a dog barking and she runs to hide behind a tree. No gentleman who cares for his good name can be seen with the scarlet woman of lie. He tells her he is well aware of her situation. He tries to hook her up with a better job elsewhere, but she says she can't leave town because she's waiting for the French lieutenant here, but she also admits that he's not coming back because he left on purpose. We cut back to Miss Pulteney's office, where she lectures Woodruff on multiple reports that she was seen looking out at the sea again. <laughs> you whore! Looking at the ocean! Who, who, who is reporting back to this woman? It's the farmer lady. That's who's doing it. Yeah. She probably gets money for doing it. You will confine your walks to where it is seemly. Do I make myself clear? We cut back to Ernestina's house, and for some reason, Pulteney is here with Miss Woodruff. It seems Mary, the servant, has a history with Miss Pulteney. It's that Mrs. Pulteney. Who's that? The one who kicked me out in the street. Is it? Poison a tea. Poison a tea. <laughs> I do not know what that is from. It's from the Red Letter Media Phantom Menace review. Oh. <laughs> hey, you guys got any rat poison lying around? Put it in the tea! Put it in the tea! They'll drink it! Put the rat poison in the tea! So anyways... Smithson and Ernestina are both here too. I'm not sure what Pulteney's business is with this family. Pulteney brings up some local gossip about Upper Crest servant Mary talking to Londoner servant Sam again. While she tells the story, Woodruff slips a note into Smithson's napkin and he quickly covers it with his arm. Unclear from this angle if his fiance noticed the handoff, but she seems bothered by their interaction. Smithson, like me, doesn't understand why servants from two classes aren't allowed to speak to each other, but everyone else gets it implicitly. Your future wife is a better judge than you are of these things, Mr. Smithson. That night, Smithson creeps suspiciously through a cemetery until he hears Woodruff. I'm here. And we get the famous horror movie musical sting from Bach's Toccata and Fugue in D minor. It feels like a blatant joke on the horror aesthetic of the location. Do you guys recall the last time we heard this particular piece? I mentioned that I thought it was from Universal's Dracula, but it's actually used famously in a Phantom of the Opera rendition. Uh, Frankenstein versus, not Frankenstein, what, Dracula versus? No. No. Uh, Funhouse? Nope. Was it a horror movie? No, it wasn't. It was a comedy. Oh. With some racist caricatures. The titular villain lives in a castle, and this music plays oh. when we introduce the castle. Is this uh, the Fu Manchu? Or, yes. Uh, Dr. Fu the, Manchu. The fiendish plot of Dr. Fu Manchu. Smithson is furious with Woodruff for orchestrating the visit from Mrs. Pulteney because he thinks it came off as obvious. She apologizes, but she saw no other way to reach him. I'm still not clear 
how they tricked Mrs. Pulteney into coming to that house. Like, I, they didn't have business together. I don't know why Pulteney came there. I, I don't even know who, who Pulteney is. Other than some, to the town? Yeah, just yeah. a woman with money. Yeah, because, like, Ernestina's family, he, like, runs a shipyard. Yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah. Okay, what, is, what do you do? Why don't you go to London? Make a new life. If I went to London, I know what I should become. I should become what some already call me in line. Woodruff is referencing the impressive prostitution population of the city that Anna was reading about in the hotel bed. They are spooked out of the cemetery by a man exiting the adjacent church. She begs Smithson for help, but he claims there's nothing he can do. She offers to tell him the true story of what happened to her. She tells him to meet her at the undercliff near where he digs for fossils. I, I guess that's the name of the, the wall that he digs them out of, yeah. the undercliff. We cut back to present day, and Mike is looking out the window and then turns back to Anna asleep in his bed. In her sleep, she calls out the name David, but he corrects her that he is Mike, and we realize that she is having an affair with her co-star. We cut to the office of another scientist, Dr. Grogan, in the film within the film, played by Leo McKern, a.k.a. Patty Button from The Blue Lagoon last season. Smithson is admiring the man's telescope, which he jokingly claims to use searching for mermaids. So he's also near the ocean, I would guess. Is it, isn't he a doctor? Yes, Dr. Grogan. Sorry, you called him a scientist, I thought. Aren't doctors scientists? I suppose. Batman's a scientist. Is he? I don't know. <laughs> I'm losing track of this conversation. Homer, there's a man here who thinks he can help you. Batman? No, he's a scientist. Batman's a scientist. It's not Batman. Grogan pours them each a glass of his finest brandy. He sparks up a couple cigars for them, and they discuss their mutual interest in science. Grogan's voice here reminds me a lot of Brian Blessed's, actually. Mm. Now you approve of my telescope? Smithson can't get Woodruff off his mind and brings her up here as a curious case of local flora. But wouldn't Woodruff be fauna, though? Unless he's comparing her to a flower. <laughs> Evidently, this scientist, or doctor, or medical doctor, I don't know, uh, has already thoroughly diagnosed Woodruff's predicament. He refers to the three recorded types of melancholia theorized by a Dr. Hartman. One he calls natural, by which he means that one is born with a, a sad temperament. Another he calls occasional, by which he means springing from an occasion. And the third class he calls obscure melancholia, by which he really means poor man. He doesn't know what the devil it is that's caused it. Smithson mentions a potential occasion to blame 18 months back, but Grogan thinks that is not the explanation for her problems. Dr. Grogan admits that he was called to help Woodruff once and prescribed travel, but she refused to leave the town, as she still does. Instead, she continued hard labor, and the doctor came to conclude that she enjoyed punishing herself. He quotes Hartman's words, referring to another sufferer of obscure melancholia. It was as if her torture had become her delight. The takeaway from this conversation is that if Smithson can somehow get Woodruff to speak the truth of her past, she would magically be cured by having revealed it. But she does not want to be cured. The next day, he meets with her by the undercliff, and she tells him her story. She tells of Vargan, her Frenchman. He experienced a shipwreck and was brought to a home where she was working. The Frenchman was badly injured, and she nursed him back to health. It sounds like a classic Nightingale Syndrome situation. She was also very flattered by the attention he paid her while she worked. When he left, he said he was sailing for France, and she told him she would not follow him. And this all happened in Lyme Regis? Yes, 18 months ago. She did go to his hotel room before he set sail, but her interactions with him seemed insincere to her, and she thought him changed. She also admits to sleeping with him that night. I gave myself to him. I did it. So that I should never be the same again, so that I should be seen for the outcast I am. Smithson has heard enough. That shame seems to keep her going. It's what powers her through the day. I am hardly human anymore. I am the French lieutenant. Whore. Smithson insists again that she should leave town for good. They suddenly hear a couple walking down a nearby path, and the man chases a girl into the bushes like they're going to have sex right there. Smithson tells Woodruff to leave by herself and that they can never be alone together again. We cut from that to Mike and Anna on a very rocky beach with a picnic basket and wine. He senses a sadness in her, but she denies it. Why are you sad? I'm not. It reminds me of a very similar film, and I'll discuss more of the similarities later, Adaptation 
Yes. When she much. goes and meets the Native Americans who are allowed to collect the ghost orchid. I can see a sadness. It's lovely. Well, I'm just tired, that's all. That's my problem. <laughs> Back in the film, Woodruff comes walking out of the wilderness and an old farmer woman takes note so that she can report the infraction to the entire town and in particular Miss Pulteney. At night, we see Woodruff staring down her reflection in the mirror while doing a charcoal drawing of her own face. She's done several and she stacks them on a desk. I was going to say about the drawings. Yeah. I mean, I think they're interesting because they look kind of sinister yeah. and evil. Like, yeah. like this is how she sees herself. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it definitely doesn't resemble Meryl Streep very closely. Yeah, I mean, it, it, she's, you know, she's, you know, has her face turned down and they're very dark. Uh, Shadowed. Yeah. yeah. But she's also doing them from memory. No, she has a she reflection has a me- in front of her. She has a mirror in front of her. <laughs> <laughs> Just joking. Mirrory. That's what he meant to say. <laughs> Pulteney calls to her from downstairs and she ignores the distant cries. And we cut to Smithson in a chair as a note is slipped under the door to his study. The note reads, I am at the barn on the undercliff. I beg you to see me one last time. No, you aren't. You're out in the hallway. There's no one you could trust to deliver this message. Right now, you're running through the front yard to escape this neighborhood unseen. (laughs) Smithson takes a horse and carriage to Dr. Grogan's residence and learns that he has been called to the asylum tonight. I assume this would be a related matter, but it's not, it turns out. Smithson continues to the asylum and is led to the doctor who is currently assisting in a breech birth. Apparently, doctors had to work in a full suit and top hat to deliver babies in this era. And why are you delivering a baby at the asylum? That's just the best place. It's padded, you know, it's safe. <laughs> just just in case the baby comes yeah. squirting right out of there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he learns from the doctor that Pulteney fired Woodruff, and he admits he has a note from her. Grogan tells Smithson to wait at his home to discuss this matter, and we keep cutting to Woodruff looking like Mother Gothel from Tangled, scouring the hillside in a dark cloak looking for glowing flowers. (laughs) At Grogan's home office, he swears on their Bible, a first edition of Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species, not to divulge anything Smithson is about to tell him. Grogan talks through Woodruff's entire story from her perspective. At the end, he concludes that it's a trap to hurt Smithson's reputation. Woodruff's luring him out so that they can be caught together. Smithson thinks this is preposterous. Oh, my most sacred honor. Nothing improper has passed between us. But Grogan points out that Smithson wishes it had, and even now he's contemplating going to see her. Grogan offers to find Woodruff himself and to turn her away on his behalf. I like to think he just went out and had sex with her that night at the (laughs) bar. It's me, Smithson. (laughs) Yeah. It's real dark. Don't get too close. Smithson agrees to the plan and to reimburse Grogan for his effort. The next morning, Smithson looks very hungover in his bed, and he looks out the bedroom window to see a matte painting of the cob out at sea. He imagines the first moment when he locked eyes with Woodruff at the end of it. He decides he must find her. He hikes all the way out to the barn on the undercliffs, for some reason assuming she'll still be here, and she is, (laughs) asleep in a pile of hay. Does that mean the doctor never came? He came and he put a coat on her, Hmm. but he just left her there because she didn't have anywhere else to go. But he delivered the message that Smithson wasn't coming. She has what must be Grogan's coat draped over her, and Smithson is about to lay down a second coat when she wakes up. She looks terrified of him, but he assures her he's here to help. They kiss passionately and are, of course, immediately spotted by Sam and Mary walking by in the foggy morning mist. Or I guess the misty morning fog. In the misty morning fog. Smithson rushes out to intercept them and scrambles together a story that the doctor sent him here to check on her. And he makes Sam agree to keep Mary quiet as well when it's clear that he's not buying the story. He's like, make yeah. sure make sure she doesn't say anything. <laughs> when they leave, Smithson returns to Miss Woodruff and apologizes for taking advantage of her situation. He warns her that she may be sent to the asylum if she doesn't leave for Exeter. He gives her directions out of town and money to pay her way. He even gives her the contact information for his own attorney who will send her more money when she needs it. So why now is she so willing to leave? Because he told her that she's going to get sent to the asylum. She's enjoyed her freedom here, but now she thinks it's in peril and that she's going to be locked up. I mean, that wasn't a threat before. I feel like... I don't think it's a threat now. I think he's making it up because he wants her to leave town. Because I I would have thought, like, Dr. Grogan, who seems to be associated with the asylum... Right. It would have brought her back if that was the case. Yeah. Yeah. As they part, he tells her she's a remarkable person. Yes, I am a remarkable person. We cut back to the film set and Anna is picking through the fruits beside the craft service truck. She joins Mike at his table and it seems she is wrapped for the production. We'll find out later she has more scenes, but right now it seems like she's wrapped. He asks if her husband David is here, but he calls him David, so I don't know 
which one I should go with. And she says he's flying in tonight. Mike still has more to shoot solo, so he's stuck here when she flies home. He asks if they might meet back up in London, but she doesn't see that as being possible. She agrees to try. The AD says they're about to shoot the cups, and they need to take Mike away. And we cut to the film within the film, where Smithson pours himself some brandy in his office and is confronted by Sam. Sam can see the engagement unraveling and worries about his employment if Smithson and Ernestina don't end up together. Is that really what he's worried about? Or does he, because he wants, Sam likes the servant of yes. Ernestina. Yeah. So he wants to work with her, yes. That's more than work with her. But no, he's very professional. <laughs> he's very professional. <laughs> no, but I, I think part of it is that and part of it is that he has these grand financial plans for the future and if he fucks this up th then he's not going to need a servant anymore and this guy's going to be out on his ass oh like he can't afford a servant long term or that's what it seems like okay. later in the story i i don't know if that's the case but that's what it seemed like to me smithson reminds the boy that he is not unemployed yet and must follow orders in this case he is to ride to london and prepare smithson's london home for his return from lyme Smithson takes a carriage to Ernestina's home, and Mary points him to the garden to speak with her. He offers her a coin on his way through the entry hall in gratitude for her service. As soon as he's out of sight, she tests it in her teeth since he is not a rich man. It's not gratitude for her service. It's for her silence. Yeah. That, that's the service I meant. Okay. I mean, does that work? Well, yeah, I think I think they are testing for softness, and if it, if it is supposed to be gold, that is what they're testing for with their teeth. Yeah. But this was obviously not a gold coin, so I don't know what she's doing. I don't know the rule. I don't need a lot of money. I don't eat. I don't need a lot of money. Yeah, just some. <laughs> Smithson finds Ernestina firing arrows across her backyard at a bullseye, and it seems like a bad time to have this conversation with her. He says he has to leave to discuss the marriage with his attorney in London. She's upset to lose him for any amount of time, but he promises to be back in three days. He gives her a flower he found in her own backyard and a kiss. In London, Miss Woodruff reaches Endicott's Hotel, where she was instructed to go by Smithson. We cut to Smithson playing a sport known at the time as cool tennis. <laughs> it is played in a rectangle about the size of a normal tennis court, but instead of an out-of-bounds area, there's a seven-foot wall around the court, and then, where an audience might be seated, there is instead a rectangle of ramps tilted down toward the court to funnel the ball back into play. It seems you can hit the ball at whatever surface you like as long as it lands twice on the other guy's side and you get your point. I actually looked it up and no joke, the correct name for this sport is Real Tennis. Yeah. It's called Real Tennis. Real Tennis. Isn't that fucking awesome? Uh. This, this looks so much more fun than tennis and it's called Real Tennis. I love it. I'm going to say that to anyone I know who ever tells me about tennis again. <laughs> How many people yeah, but do you play about? real tennis <laughs> with the fucking ramps and shit? I think there's supposed to be like roofs like around the Well, whatever structure. it is, the ball's allowed to hit them. It's no, not I know. cheating. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's so it, awesome. It's, it's, it's not like it's like they created an obstacle course. It's like it's it's like in within a courtyard that has roofs around it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how tall the whole room is because you don't even see the top of this room. Yeah. It's like 30 feet off the ground. Because from what I read, uh, really high lob shots are completely allowed. <laughs> That's awesome. Like you could you can just let it float up in the air and come back down if That's you want. That's crazy. Also, the whole room is completely painted black. I'm assuming so you can spot the ball easier. Oh, maybe. But this is a real court for real tennis. I Because yes. uh, on the Wikipedia page, there's a picture of this court. <laughs> Both men are playing in pants, long sleeve shirts, and vests. In the locker room afterwards, Smithson is congratulated for his prowess at real tennis. His real tennis opponent was his attorney. And he tells the man that if Miss Woodruff asks for money, he will give it to her. He doesn't want an argument here, and he doesn't get one. Smithson arrives at his London home, and Sam asks for the night off, but he can't have it. Smithson needs to prepare to head out to a club tonight to meet with other gentlemen. We cut right to a massive Stanley Cup-sized goblet being filled with champagne, and one of Smithson's friends, played by Mr. Dernsley, a.k.a. Richard Griffiths, starts ladling it into a cup for him. This location is the historic Garrick Club in London. They all seem fully wasted. All of a sudden, we get our first wipe transition to the men drinking more later. They make plans to hit the local brothels to celebrate their night together, and Smithson seems hesitant, probably because he's worried he'll find Woodruff there. But as they leave the club, Smithson can't keep his balance, and his friends watch as he collapses through a table to the floor. I'm assuming this is his bachelor party. Oh, is that what's oh, going that, on? That, that makes sense. That makes more sense. I did not get that at all, but you're totally right. I, I do like 
the fall into the table because that table just totally flips. Like, yeah, it looks like it smacks him in the back of the head. Like it's a yes. hard landing. And, and I like that the the waiters or the serving staff do absolutely nothing. Yeah. <laughs> they just stare judgmentally at the guy and his friends who are applauding this really painful looking landing. The next morning, a young boy in a bowler cap delivers a message to Smithson from Mr. Montague, his attorney. After collecting the envelope, Sam decides to read the message first by carefully prying open the wax seal to read its contents before resealing it. Smithson is asleep on the couch in his office when Sam gives him the letter. The note simply says, Endicott's Family Hotel, Exeter. He wrinkles it up and tosses it away where Sam could have found it anyway. In her hotel room, Miss Woodruff unpacks what few things she has. We cut back to Smithson's office as he writes a note that reads, There must be no further communication between us. Sam brings him tea while he writes. He brings up the issue again that in the future he intends to go into business for himself. Business? Yes, sir. What kind of business? Drapers and haberdashers. He found a shop he'd like to buy for 280 units. <laughs> and he saved 30 units. But by his math, he needs three years to pay the rest of his way. I don't know, I don't know the unit because he didn't say anything. And yeah. with British money, it could be a <laughs> plethora of things. So I took this to be the start of blackmail. Same. But uh, like, okay. so that's how I'm reading this situation. Like essentially I know something about you and I want to get money out of this situation so that I could follow my dreams. Yeah. Uh, but nothing ever really comes of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, the Sam story kind of falls apart anyway. Yeah. B but yeah, I, I for sure was reading it the same way. It's like, oh. That makes sense. Fuck, he is gonna sell you out. Yeah. yeah. He tells Sam that he will keep his plans in mind, but for now they must return to Lyme. The train arrives at a stop in Exeter, and Smithson suggests that they stay the night here at a hotel instead of taking a carriage out to Lyme so late. Because it's going to rain. Yeah, he says it's going <laughs> to rain. Um, and this, in the book, is where we get three separate endings. Start from this point. Mm. This is the dividing line. Smithson finds Endicott's and asks to speak with Miss Woodruff, a guest of the hotel, the lady at the front counter says that she sprained her ankle coming down the stairs and she's not doing well, but when she starts the story, it almost sounds like she's going to say that she died here. <laughs> I miss Woodruff. Oh, the poor young lady, sir. She was a coming downstairs yesterday morning and she slipped, sir. She turned her ankle terrible. Smithson goes along with the woman's assumption that he is a policeman and she sends him directly to Woodruff's room. When Smithson enters the room, she looks shocked and he claims that he was only in town by coincidence. She begins to tremble and cry on the way to speaking to him, and he apologizes for coming at all. She explains that she was worried she'd never see him again, and she's not upset by the visit. A piece of coal rolls out of her fireplace onto the rug, and he smacks the coal and the rug for a bit with a fireplace broom before picking the rug up and draping it over her legs. This thing is dirty as fuck now, and it was just about to be on fire a second ago. What are you doing? Don't put that on her. It's nice and warm now. They used to put coals and tins under, in between mattresses that's because they needed to save them <laughs> i don't want anyone to steal my coals my coals cash i call it <laughs> he's barely let go of the rug blanket thing before they are smashing their faces together he carries her through a pair of double doors to a bed and lays her down she watches him undress from the bed when he finally penetrates her she lets out a groan of pain which surprises him she pulls him down to her and he continues thrusting for about eight seconds before he seems finished. <laughs> I think the point is supposed to be that he's wanted this very badly for yeah. a while. Um, but it is also comically short amount of time. <laughs> she pats him on the head after he collapses on her. Outside, Sam spots the hotel mentioned in the letter he intercepted. Smithson and Woodruff have only given in to their urges twice in the film, and both times they were immediately discovered by this guy and his magical cock-blocking powers. Back in the bedroom, Woodruff confesses that the Frenchman story was made up, and this was her first time having sex. He existed, and she did care for him, but when she got to his hotel before he sailed away, she noticed he already had a woman with him. She left without seeing him that night. Smithson has a bout of post-nut clarity and realizes he should do the right thing and break off his engagement with Ernestina. Miss Woodruff tells him that she knew this day would come from the first time she saw him, and she has longed for it. He makes plans to return to Lyme and break things off with his fiance, but he will return here in a day's time. Sam is standing across the street checking his watch to see how long Smithson lasts with this woman. If only he knew. <laughs> <laughs> He's been in there for hours, the lucky dog. <laughs> Smithson and Woodruff kiss each other goodbye and he promises to return tomorrow. 
It seems clear already from a common moviegoer's perspective that she will not be here when he <laughs> returns. The question is, where will she be? We cut to the present again as Mike meets Anna with a half sandwich wrapped in plastic as her train begins to pull away. They give each other a few quick kisses and he asks her to stay here with him one more night, but she won't do it. He steps off and walks with the train as it leaves Exeter Station, and the parallels are obvious here. The couple they play in the film is in the same conundrum, only she's the one with a husband, at least so far that we know about. They separate at the same Exeter train station because one of them has business left to attend to, i.e. the film, or breaking off an engagement. Ernestina is amusingly playing solitaire when Smithson arrives. He asks her to sit down for some important news. He frames breaking up the engagement as being for her sake, and he says he's not good enough for her and her family. I've come to tell you the truth. The truth? What truth? As I have, after many hours of the deepest and the most painful consideration, come to the conclusion that I am not worthy of you. Not worthy I'm of you? I'm totally me. unworthy. Oh, you are joking. <laughs> I just like the way he says Totally unworthy. Oh, oh my God. You can you would not believe how unworthy I am of you. Scale of one to 10. I, 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 whichever, whichever one is most unworthy. Yeah. I mean, he's not wrong. Right. No, <laughs> that it's true, but he's making it seem like not because of anything I did. Just holy shit. Are you good? I gotta go. <laughs> he claims that he only entered into this contract because of an interest in her father's wealth. She asks if he ever loved her, and he just repeats that he's not worthy. We're not worthy! We're not worthy! We're Before not she storms out of the room to hide her tears. First, she tries a door into the hallway, but her mom's standing there, so she, like, slams the door and turns around, and she's like, ah, shit, there's nowhere I can go, and she just cries in the corner. She tells him that she knows that she's boring, and she hoped being married to him would make her more interesting. As she observes him, though, she concludes that this excuse is a lie, and that he's met someone else. I'm not that worthy. He confirms her suspicions, but lies that it's a woman she's never heard of, that he's known for a long time. <laughs> yeah, I got a girlfriend in Canada. Yeah, you wouldn't know her. <laughs> exactly. As he leaves, she assures him that her father will drag his name through the mud. At his desk in Lyme, Smithson begins composing a letter to Mr. Freeman when he's interrupted by Sam with a glass of brandy on a silver platter. Seems like he's ready for round two of this attempt. What the devil do you want? I didn't ring. You lost brandy, sir. Which in this situation could either mean, I get it, this is a difficult time for you, or, all right, let's talk about money again. When Smithson confirms the wedding is off, Sam puts together that Smithson will return to London and will no longer employ him as a servant. He quits his job then and there, and Smithson heads back to Endicott's, of course he learns when he gets here, that she checked out of the hotel and took the three o'clock train to London. He assumes she's lying and busts into the room anyway to find it empty. Since Woodruff has left no forwarding address, he intends to scour the room for clues, but there's nothing here. We cut to the present, and Mike calls Anna's hotel room in London. Her husband answers it, so he doesn't say a word before her husband hangs up. David looks at Anna like he knows what's going on. She tried to grab the phone before him, and someone, presumably a man, didn't want to talk to another man. Who was that? I don't know he put the phone down. Who did? I don't know, he didn't say. Maybe it was the wrong number. Yes, maybe. We cut to Mike at home, staring embarrassed at the phone. Suddenly, in the background, a wife comes wandering up behind him and two children. Twist! They're both involved people. He pitches to his wife that they host a barbecue for the cast, and she says okay as long as he doesn't invite the entire crew. Only above the liners at my barbecue, please. Not suspiciously at all, Mike dials the hotel room again, and gets David again only to admit that it's him and that he's inviting them to a barbecue this weekend. He hands the phone to Anna and Mike makes a joke about their characters in the film. Where are you? You've gone. You went in your hotel room. What? From Exeter. Oh. <laughs> Come to lunch on Sunday. By the way, I love you. Oh, great. Um, sure, we'd love to come. I'll see you then. I said I love you. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think that she's no going... he, he knows he's just fucking with her okay back in the film within a film smithson and his attorney are literally taking a magnifying glass to the newspapers to look for any sign of miss woodruff maybe you need to increase the font size of your newspaper if people <laughs> literally need magnifying glasses to read it I, I actually think it's impressive that they were able to get create such small print yeah it's probably cheaper paper wise 
And inkwise. <laughs> we print this whole newspaper on this five by seven leaflet. <laughs> yeah. They check church schools, female clerical agencies, anywhere a woman might stop for a paycheck. The attorney also mentions he'll be keeping an eye on the obituaries, and Smithson agrees somberly to the necessity. One last question, sir, for the moment. Does the lady wish to be found, would you say, or not? I cannot say. We get a single shot in the present where a taxi drops Anna off outside a building and she promises to be back in 15 minutes. Then we're back in the film where Smithson's attorney is reading a letter from Mr. Freeman. They are serving him a summons to appear in court. His lawyer presumes they will ask him to sign a written confession of his adultery and he will be released. Anna walks through a warehouse overflowing with costumes and a tailor helps her pick out a fabric for a dress. We cut to the judge at Smithson's trial played by David Warner. Yay! I, I saw him in the cast and I was like, when's he going to show up? Yeah, he took his time. Smithson is asked to confirm that he has broken the engagement contract. I didn't realize there was a contract before the marriage contract, but apparently they take this very seriously in olden times. Included in his confession, prepared by the Freemans, is the name of his mistress, Sarah Woodruff. By signing the papers, he agrees to forfeit the right to be considered a gentleman. <laughs> this confession also grants Ernestina all rights to the document. What does... The injured party may make whatever you she desires of this document mean. It means precisely what it says. She might, for instance, wish to have it published in the Times. And she would be free to do that? She would indeed. Smithson says fuck it, signs the confession, and yeets it all in the judge's face. In the present, Anna returns to her taxi, and they head to the backyard party. Smithson rides a horse and carriage through the back streets of London, literally just looking out the windows, hoping to find her in some random back alley. Well, I mean, he does see a group of women. Right, yes. That, like, could, you know, they look like factory workers yes. or something, yeah. so she could have been amongst them. They stop outside a factory, and he watches the workers parading out at the end of the day, but she is not among them. We see him strolling past white-faced prostitutes in London's back alleys at night. They're in so much makeup that they almost look like mimes but I think it was a branding thing at the time, so you knew which ones were selling. <laughs> With all the bills posted on the brick buildings, it reminded me a lot of Whitechapel from Hammer's Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde earlier this season, and it could even be the same set, I don't know. Yeah. Smithson doesn't find Woodruff here, and most of these girls will be killed by the Ripper anyway. I wish we'd seen one of them getting dragged away by old leather apron. <laughs> but he follows one. He or, does. And, and then does he engage her? Well, because so he, he wa she like walks back to him and then they walk off together. Yes. So he, he finds one girl who bears a resemblance to Woodruff, but on closer inspection, it is not her. And he stands across the street as another prostitute is thrown out on her ass through the doors of the pub. Again, we saw people doing this same thing in Sister Hyde and they were basically throwing these girls to the slaughter because at the end of the night, someone would come by and scoop them up and kill them. Smithson spots a woman in a red cloak who looks nothing like Woodruff to my eyes, but he follows her around a corner and eventually he catches up with her and recognizes that she is not Woodruff, but then he realizes that he doesn't care that it's the wrong person, and he follows her into a hotel. And he'll kind of hint at this later a little bit. Back in the present, Anna knocks on Mike's front door, and she and her husband walk in to shake hands with Mike's wife, Sonia. In the backyard, Mike is playing a game of what they called at the time lame tennis, <laughs> a.k.a. ping pong. It's fun to see all the characters from the film we've been watching within the film now as actors in a backyard party together, having yeah. a polite party. We see Leo McKern, who plays Dr. Grogan, sitting in a chair. I was really hoping David Warner would be here doing something silly, but maybe they only had him for a day or something. Well, we will get him later. Right. Then we get real meta when David and Mike discuss the film on the porch. David is under the impression that they haven't decided how to end the story. No, no, no. Where did you hear that? Well, there are two endings in the book. A happy ending and an unhappy ending, no? We're going for the first ending. I mean the second ending. And by the book, he obviously means the one adapted into this film. For this and many reasons, I submit that French Lieutenant's Woman and Spike Jones's adaptation would make an excellent double feature because they both star Meryl Streep as a central character. They both take place half in a film within the film, and they were both adapted from famously unadaptable novels, one of them literally called Adaptation. Yeah. <laughs> no narrative really unites these passages. New York Times book review. I can't structure this. It's that sp sprawling New Yorker shit. Obviously, both adaptations take huge liberties with their books, with completely fabricated segments inserted into the story to keep the audience awake. Mike insists they're going with the happy ending. Anna enters the house and comes face to face with Sonia. She asks who takes care of their yard, and she says she does it herself. I really envy you. Envy me, why? 
for being able to create such a lovely garden. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't bother to envy me if I were you. <laughs> Sonia moves a vase of flowers into the house and we see Sam and Ernestina, or their actors, sitting at a piano playing a song together. Mike finds Anna and pulls her into a room separate from the party and tries to kiss her. She's called away again and leaves with David, but Mike hangs back to hide that they were in a room together. He moves to the front window to watch them leave. A title card shows up that says three years later, and I was immediately annoyed until I realized that it was three years later within the film, within yeah. the film, and not three years later in the present. Yeah, my note was very exasperated. Like, three years later, all caps, like, what yeah. the hell? But it turns out nothing has happened because it's the film within the film, and he's still looking for her. Smithson sits in a chair near water on a small square yard of grass when he is handed a note from his attorney, which reads simply, she is found under the name Roughwood. Maybe include alive in here or yeah. some some other information. Is he in some kind of like convalescence home? I can't tell what this place is. Because it looks like the only other people who are there is like an old couple who seem kind of out of it. Yeah, and he's like just knocked out in a yeah. chair. Also, I really want Sarah to be like, I need a new name. Yeah. Roughwood. Nice. Yeah, very clever. <laughs> Woodruff. Roughwood. Brilliant. Jeremy's iron. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. He clutches the note against his chest and we cut right to him on a boat headed for her. He has a beard now and the smoke from the steam powered paddle boat is bright yellow to the point that it reminds me of the train from Back to the Future 3. It seems completely the wrong color, but I'm sure it's right. This particular boat is actually the earliest functional steamboat in existence. So it's a real boat. It's huh. a steam powered boat and it's the earliest one that still functions. They approach a mansion on a hill overlooking Lake Windermere. Playing outside the house are a young boy and girl, and he tells the boy he's looking for Miss Roughwood. Roughwood leads another young boy downstairs inside, but when she sees Smithson, she runs back up and leads him to her living quarters. He tells her his attorney found her, and she admits that she sent a letter to his attorney in the first place. This is what happens when you only pay for 14 letters, as you can't explain, she reached out to me. You just have to say, found, lady. He relays to her the hell he's been in for these last three years, and she doesn't excuse it away. She's a tutor to the children of this house, and Smithson recognizes her art staged on a mantle above the fireplace. These are yours. Hmm. Yes. You have found your gift. He demands an explanation for her actions, and she can only confess to madness. There was madness in me. At that time. A bitterness envy I forced myself on you knowing that you had other obligations it was unworthy I suddenly saw after you had gone that I had to destroy what had begun between us are you saying that you never loved me I could not say that but you must say that what a karmic turn for this guy, though, to learn that he thought he would spend the rest of his life with someone who potentially never loved him. Yeah. He demands that she call him a monster because otherwise this all seems so unfair to him, especially for her to invite him here now. Why be so cruel? She says she saw the ads that he was still posting in search of her three years later. She claims she has spent these three years finding herself and making a freedom for herself here. She's got a pretty good thing going, man. She does. Yeah. Like, it's a beautiful house on a lake, yeah. and she has food for life she gets to take care of these kids and she gets to just draw as much art. as she wants yeah i'm like this is a sweet gig leave her alone when he tries to storm out she grabs him and he shoves her hard to the floor there seems to be a moment here where the two actors break character and she kind of laughs a bit and he looks her in the eyes and nods as if asking for permission to continue the scene i called you here to ask your forgiveness You loved me once. If you still love me, you, you can't forgive me. He does, and they kiss. The camera dissolves to a shot of them in a rowboat paddling out of a tunnel onto the lake together. Back in the present, we are on a dance floor at the film's rap party. Here we get the shot I wanted of Mike and David Warner arguing. Yeah. When Mike spots Anna, he tilts his head toward the adjacent house as if to invite her inside. They're in the same house they used to shoot the happy ending just now, and Anna heads toward the same room. When she catches herself in a dressing room mirror, she sees her character for a moment before seeing herself. 
As Mike follows her into the house, he passes the Ernestina actress and gives her a quick kiss on his way in. After he's disappeared inside, it seems like maybe she wanted more than she got. I can't tell. Mike walks to the exact room from the film's climax and rushes across it to a row of bay windows on the front of the house. Downstairs, he sees Anna's car pulling away, so he pushes open the windows to shout to her, but he shouts the character's name, not the actress's. He turns and sits forlornly on the couch under the windows and the credits roll out over him sitting here. So the film, like the book, has a happy ending and a sad ending, and as in the book, you can choose which story to be attached to. We dissolve to the same shot of the rowboat sliding out onto the lake and more credits play over the rest of the happy ending. There's also a neutral ending here for Streep and Irons, who are both just actors that presumably didn't enter into a sexual relationship on the set of the film within the film. You mean the real life actors? Yes. Didn't So that that is a story. As far of... as I know, Jeremy Irons and Meryl Streep did not fuck on this set. Well, yes, presumably. They may have. <laughs> but that story we did not get to see. Right. But we know that story because they, they're still around. We know that they worked on this movie together. Yeah. I mean, we can... We know very little we can presume, that story. We can presume the story. Right. When Smithson and Sam stop at the Exeter station in the novel, the story splits into three alternate endings. In the first ending, he does not go to Sarah's hotel and continues on to Ernestina at home to declare his loyalty to her. He marries Ernestina and never finds out where Woodruff ended up. But this ending is dismissed at its close as a daydream, like the final season of Roseanne, the original Roseanne, before it got rebooted. <laughs> yeah. At this point, the narrator appears as an actual character in the story, sharing a compartment on the train with Smithson. He announces to the reader that the following two endings are for the audience to choose between, and flips a coin to decide what order to present them in, to make sure that it's clear they're super equal. Either one of these could be the correct answer, so it's up to you. But that one that I just said is not real. That didn't happen. Yeah. The second ending mirrors what happens in the film. Smithson goes to Woodruff. They have sex. He learns that she's a virgin who fabricated her dalliance with the French lieutenant. He breaks off his engagement. Woodruff disappears, but his attorney finds her two years later, and they're reunited in love. The only change from the film is that in their reunion, Woodruff presents to him a child she bore after their one night together. So they have a kid in that version of the story. The narrator pops back in to turn the clock back and kicks off the third and final ending. Everything is the same as in the second ending, except when Smithson meets Woodruff, he learns that she has no interest in being with him, and the child's father is never confirmed. They don't even discuss it. But there is a kid there. But she just says, I didn't ask for you to come here. Get out. I'm happy where I am. And yeah. that's the end of the story. Yeah. That's uh, The French Lieutenant's Woman. I liked it. It's a thumbs up for me. Yeah. I give it a thumbs up. I, I really enjoyed the juxtapositions of the two stories i yeah. think that yeah. they were i think it was really well crafted um, and thoughtful uh and yeah just gen generally a well-made movie uh, yeah uh, i mean you already mentioned adaptation but i was thinking about that a lot just from the, the there's so many connections that yeah, i kept coming exactly across. um but uh yeah like i i had never seen this before and so when they start with like rolling camera and and I was like, and then they go into that film. I was like, oh, are we not coming back to that? Yeah. Like, there was this, there was this, like this period, like you're like, I, oh, was that just a cinema verite moment at the start? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Just yeah. like to let us know, oh, you're gonna, you're about to watch this film that we made, yeah. and, and we're all very proud of it, kind of moment. Yeah, it was, it was pretty far into the movie before we jumped back to real life, and then I thought it was really interesting because there was only like two moments i think in the film where you actually crossed the line where you were seeing them actually film the movie sure, yeah. within the movie because most of it's you're either completely in the movie within the movie or, or they're not even on or set. you're out yeah. of it completely yeah. Yeah. there was only two moments and one is that first opening scene and i think there's one a little bit later where you actually see people interacting while shooting the movie yeah no, it's definitely an interesting way to do it and yeah. an interesting problem solve for for what they thought would be difficult for people to grasp Right, which is also like adaptation. Yeah, it's like the 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 Orchid Thief novel just being impossible to adapt. Yeah, but I like the whole cast here. Obviously, I love Patty Button. I I there's a few characters yeah. like like the uh, the old woman that hires her and the Doctor Grogan, who I'm not really sure how they connect to the story. They're just suddenly the characters are meeting with them, and it's like I like this person, but I I don't know how this connected to the story i don't know why characters. he went they're yeah. like they're yeah. like over the top and you know fun 
caricatures of, of, of people. Yeah. yeah. Well, I feel like that, uh, gosh, I I always forget, I get the names mixed up. It's Charles, right? Yes, Charles. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I feel like Charles needed some kind of friend because he doesn't have any friends. Yeah, because Sam kind of hates him the whole time. Yeah, and uh, you know the only other people that we meet are his drunk friends and his lawyer. And yeah, they're and- pretty cool. <laughs> I could I could have taken more Richard Griffiths in yeah, here. Yeah. Uh, so I feel like Grogan was like a good sounding board slash conscience. And like, they're also like partners in science. Like they're yeah. they're like very interested in like new age philosophy and and information i also liked how they they did there's a couple moments that are kind of uh with the juxtaposition of the the old time story which i think takes place in like the 1850s or 60s or 70s and the present day which i think is supposed to be 1980 or whenever they were shooting the film um how they kind of show the contrast between these two ways of life that when he's playing real tennis in the past, they're like fully decked out. They have to wear full suits. Mm-hmm. They take it very seriously. And and then in the present, the modern day equivalent is like a bunch of people in like casual wear, just like batting yeah. around a ball in a backyard and just having fun. And uh, there's other examples of that, but where, you know, he's not worried about their crew finding out about the affairs that they're having. And it's like in the past, everyone took it so seriously and they were deathly afraid of even their own servants finding out about right. it. And here it's like, I don't give a shit if the makeup lady knows that we're fucking up here. Like it's a completely yeah. changed society where people aren't judged for these things anymore. He should, he should have just hired Sam to find her because he just seems to stumble into wherever yeah. she is anyway. <laughs> um, what are we thinking letterboxed for this one? Um, so I, I have it pretty high. I have it at 29. All right. Out of how many here? 122. 122. I have it at 29 out of uh, 122. Uh, it is below body heat and above the fan. All right. Richard? Uh, I have it at 32, uh, which puts it below death hunt, but above eyewitness. Well, now I feel bad. Um, I have it in 58th out of 122, which is just under the Legend of the Lone Ranger and just above Prince of the City. I, I enjoyed it, but... Uh, it's tricky because it's really well made, but it's not something that I would choose to sit down and watch a lot of the time. Yeah. And so uh, it's it's kind of a juggle to figure out where it's going to land. I mean, I don't know that it's something I w- I'd watch a lot, but I I I would watch it again and I'm a I'm a sucker for those kinds of stories sure. like Tess and Far from the Madden Crowd, yeah. so this has that element for me. You're a me. big Thomas Hardy fan. And, and I think it's really interesting. I would I would actually do want to watch it again because I feel like I want to pay more attention to um, sort of the ups and downs of the juxtaposition because I feel yeah. like who's chasing who in each moment is, you know, I, like I, I kind of want to go back and reabsorb that now that I understand more what's happening in there because I feel like they're switching back and forth between who's pursuing who in, in which version. Yeah, well, I think what's also interesting, yeah, I think you're right that uh, that she's kind of flirting with him in the old time story, but that he's definitely the pursuer in the present yeah. in 1980. But, but but I also feel like that's that that sort of flips that like she's really into it early um, in the present day, and then she's really not yeah. towards the end of present day, and I and and that actually kind of it it, it mirrors that, but at a, at different points. Yeah. Um, within this within the old time story. On my second watch, I felt like the most telling line is when he's ushering her out of the barn over the undercliff and he tells her that she's a remarkable person and she says, yes, I am a remarkable person. Because I think that's the only very blatant hint that we get that she's just an awful person and that she is just like, I'm literally doing this to be interesting. Like that's what she wants is to be remarkable. That's why she made up this whole story with the lieutenant that... She wanted people to think that she was this interesting woman and it gave her a backstory and an yeah. identity to latch on to. Yeah. And, well, she, and she and doesn't she really care about him. Yeah, because she couldn't give that up. If she went and married him, like she would lose all of that. Right, yeah. And Everything so she, that made her interesting would be gone. So instead, she was trying to solidify that in actually sleeping with him yeah. and then disappearing. Right. But yeah, uh, I think we gave it three thumbs up, we said, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I had just never seen anything 
or I not to say like I had not seen any film like this before because clearly I've seen adaptation. Yeah, but I was surprised. I think more so from from the cover and from the 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 kind of like brief information. I was like, I I just assumed it was a Victorian piece. Yeah, it doesn't hint at the present day stuff at all. But I think that's also because they wanted fans of the book to come out and see it and they didn't want them to know, hey, we made some significant changes. Yeah. But even if they are significant, it's only about a quarter of the film that takes place in, in the present. Mm-hmm. And it definitely yeah. leans heavily on the content of the novel yeah. for the story. Um, and I think they chose the proper ending for the film because the sad ending in the book is kind of boring. If you if you do the exact same scene over again and she just says, what, no, go away. Same scene over again and she just says, like, there's you wouldn't just play that as a follow-up to what you just saw. Um, yeah, but I also think it kind of goes along with the idea that in in novels and in, in these, like, romance things, yeah, you have this happy ending, but that's not how it actually is in real life. In real life, they aren't going to get together. Right, yeah. This person made a commitment to someone else, and yeah. they're going to go back to that person. Our director here was Carol Rice. Before this, he directed Night Must Fall and The Gambler. After disappointing adaptations of his previous novels, The Collector and The Magus, Fowles insisted on approval for the director, and his first choice was Rice. When presented with the story, Rice turned down the offer, as he had just wrapped a period piece and wanted a change. Since the film was still in development hell ten years later, Rice agreed to attach himself in 1979, but admitted to the project's intimidating history of being shelved. Other directors considered or attached to this film included Sidney Lumet, Robert Bolt, Fred Zinneman, Milos Forman, Mike Nichols, Richard Lester, Lindsay Anderson, Franklin J. Schaffner, John Frankenheimer, and Michael Kakianis. The novel here is from John Foles. The author's work was also adapted into 1965's The Collector and 68's The Magus, apparently not to his liking, and also the stories that were adapted into The Last Chapter and Grey. Writer Harold Pinter is a British playwright known best for his plays The Birthday Party, The Homecoming, and Betrayal. He also has screenwriting credits on several films, including this, a 1990 adaptation of Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale, and the 2007 remake of Sleuth, still starring Michael Caine but in the opposite role against Jude Law. Apparently they couldn't get Olivier to come back and play the young man in the remake. The music here was from Carl Davis. His IMDb page is a little confusing because he is still working today, and yet he is the credited composer on films as far back as Intolerance in 1916, despite being born 20 years later in 1936. (laughs) A lot of these films hit theaters without a soundtrack, and the music was performed live during the film's exhibition. So somewhere along the line, Mr. Davis was brought in to compose an original score to films like Safety Last, Greed, Phantom of the Opera, and The General from the silent film era. In the mid to late 70s, he composed mostly for TV shows and miniseries. This was a rare non-television gig for him at the time. He does have a handful of acting credits as well, including an appearance alongside Meryl Streep in 2016's Florence Foster Jenkins. The cinematographer here was Freddie Francis. He has two Oscars for cinematography on Glory in 1990 and Sons and Lovers in 1961. He's mostly a DP on things like The Elephant Man last season, Dune, Return to Oz, Cape Fear, School Ties, and we saw him last in the director's chair for Trog. Editor John Bloom, he previously cut Funeral in Berlin, which would in turn be edited into MacGyver's Coffin Jet Ski opening gambit. So John Bloom kind of edited a bit of a MacGyver episode. (laughs) I really want that jet ski to be in that original film as well. Yes. And MacGyver's in it too. They were just like, oh, this is great. This scene has Richard Dean Anderson in it. He also cut The Lion in Winter, The Message, Orca, and Magic before this, and after he cuts Gandhi, Air America, First Wives Club, and The 2000 Shaft. Man, that's, a, that's quite a variety of yes, films to edit. totally. And a MacGyver episode. That's a lot. Meryl Streep played Sarah and Anna. Other actresses considered for the part included Charlotte Rampling, as I mentioned before, and also Gemma Jones, Francesca Annis, and Fowles' number one choice was Helen Mirren. When Streep was chosen, Fowles thoroughly approved and said he always thought Sarah Woodruff exhibited an American spirit in the story. Before this, Streep had appeared to much acclaim in The Deer Hunter, Manhattan, and Kramer vs. Kramer. Though she got unanimously rave reviews, Streep considers this one of her worst performances, mostly because as Anna, she has to fake a British accent and was not comfortable with how it turned out. After, she made Sophie's Choice, the next year for another nomination, and Silkwood the next year for another nomination. And later she makes Plenty, Out of Africa, A Cry in the Dark, Postcards from the Edge. One of my favorites is her part in Zemeckis' Death Becomes Her. 
and she voiced one of Bart's girlfriends on The Simpsons, specifically Jessica Lovejoy. And you wouldn't believe the celebrities who did cameos, Dustin Hoffman, Michael Jackson. Of course, they didn't use their real names, but you could tell it was them. From 21 Oscar nominations, she has won three for Kramer vs. Kramer, Sophie's Choice, and The Iron Lady. At the time of his death of cancer, she was married to Fredo Corleone actor John Cazale, who was only in five films in his whole life, all of which were nominated for Best Picture, some against each other. Jeremy Irons was Charles and Mike. This part was also offered to James Fox after a decade of semi-retirement, dedicating himself to evangelical Christian movements, and he turned it down for moral reasons. Others considered for the part included Robert Redford and Richard Chamberlain. Two years later, Jeremy Irons would appear in another Harold Pinter script, namely Betrayal. We saw him last season in his first film role as Mikhail Fokine in Nijinsky. He plays two characters again later in Cronenberg's Dead Ringers, He's Kafka in 1991's Kafka. He's best known to my generation, either as the voice of Scar in Lion King, or for playing Simon Gruber in Die Hard with a Vengeance, brother of Alan Rickman's Hans Gruber from the first film. He also plays protagonist Humbert Humbert in Adrian Lin's Lolita remake. He's credited as Uber Morlock in the 2002 Time Machine. Yeah. Uber Morlock? Yeah, that, that Time Machine movie is a bit messy. Wasn't it also written or directed by a descendant of H.G. Wells? Yeah, Simon Wells, I yeah. believe. And I think, was maybe, was Brenda Chapman? No, Brenda Chapman wasn't involved in that. But but Simon Wells was for sure. Yeah. No relation? No. <laughs> to you. No. <laughs> <laughs> Although my mom did want to name me Herbert George. <laughs> That'd be interesting. He was also recently Alfred to Ben Affleck's Batman. Hilton McRae played Sam. This was his first feature film. His second was Return of the Jedi, in which he plays Arvel Crinid. Very typical Star Wars name. He later shows up in Greystoke, The Legend of Tarzan, Lord of the Apes, and Max Headroom, and Mansfield Park. He's in the 2015 Far From the Madding Crowd as Jacob Smallbury. Recently, he was Judge Kadnikov in Chernobyl, and he currently plays Regret on the Halo TV series. Emily Morgan played Mary. She was vomiting Veronica at wedding number two in Four Weddings and a Funeral. Actress Wendy Morgan, who we saw last season as Cherry in The Mirror Cracked, was offered this role first, but took part in a stage play instead. Lindsay Baxter played Ernestina. This was her first film. I didn't recognize much else, but her first credit was for playing the title character in a mid-70s adaptation of Little Match Girl for television. Peter Vaughn played Mr. Freeman. He's back later this season as Winston the Ogre in Time Bandits and returns to Gilliam's trilogy of imagination as Mr. Helpman in Brazil. Yeah. But sadly, he didn't make it into the adventures of Baron Munchausen. He's also Mackenzie in The Racer's Edge, Francis Abbott Sr., Gene Wilder's uncle in Haunted Honeymoon, and Daddy Zoo in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Not that Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. He was in the 2001 version, not the 2005 version. He also showed up in The Life and Death of Peter Sellers as Peter's father, Bill. Most recently, he was Maester Eamon on Game of Thrones. Liz Smith was Mrs. Fairley. She was Mrs. Plunkett in High Spirits and Grandma Georgina in Tim Burton's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Patience Collier played Mrs. Pulteney. She was Grandma Zedel in Fiddler on the Roof and Julie in Countess Dracula. John Barrett played Dairyman. He plays Jack in Robin and Marion with Sean Connery and Audrey Hepburn. Leo McKern was Dr. Grogan. We saw him last in The Blue Lagoon as Patty Button. He's also Imperious in Lady Hawk, Thomas Cromwell in A Man for All Seasons, and he goes uncredited for his part as Carl Bugenhagen in Damien Omen 2. Arabella Weir played Girl on Undercliff. She developed, wrote, and starred in a series called Posh Posh, which I'd never heard of, but listen to this cast. It's her and Richard E. Grant as a married couple who run a restaurant. It's narrated by Joanna Lumley, and David Tennant plays a recurring character. But they're like eight-minute episodes, so I don't know where this... It's a web series? It was early for a web series. Oh. It was in the early 2000s, but it's possible that's what it was. Ben Forster, not Ben Foster, Ben Forster, played Boy on Undercliff. He was Dinky Dunkley on the Molly Wopsies, which I was obviously very excited to say. <laughs> it's the most British-sounding thing I've ever I heard. I think it's a kid's show. Uh, more recently, his credits are all for voicing Mr. Perkins in various Thomas the Train direct-to-video releases. Catherine Wilmer played Dr. Grogan's housekeeper. She was Sister Catherine in The Devils and Dr. Houston in Oh Lucky Man. Richard Griffiths played Sir Tom. We've seen him so far in Breaking Glass and Superman 2, and he's back later this season for Chariots of Fire and Ragtime. He's Uncle Vernon in the Harry Potter movies, but the first thing I always go to is Dr. Meinheimer slash Earl Hacker in The Naked Gun 2 and a half. <laughs> Graham Fletcher Cook played Delivery Boy. I think that's the one who takes the 
letter from Mr. Montague and gives it to Sam before he opens it. He's the brother of actor-slash-director Dexter Fletcher, who we saw last season in The Elephant Man. As a result, he shows up in films his brother has directed, namely Eddie the Eagle and Rocket Man recently. Graham also has a written and directed feature entitled Blood and Carpet. David Warner played Murphy. We've seen him so far in The Ballad of Cable Hogue and The Island. Great movies. He's back this season in Time Bandits. He's Spicer Lovejoy in Titanic, Ed Dillinger in Tron, Dr. Wren in The Mouth of Madness, Winston Smiles on Briscoe County Jr., a Klingon somewhere in space, I think. He's the voice of Archmage on Gargoyles and Ra's al Ghul in Batman the Animated Series. And five years before this film, he appeared opposite Dr. Grogan actor Leo McKern in The First Omen. Alan Armstrong played Grimes. He was Corporal Davies in A Bridge Too Far, Torquil in Crawl, Owens in Patriot Games, and The High Constable in Sleepy Hollow. Penelope Wilton played Sonia. That's the wife of jeremy irons she has lots of british television but american audiences will recognize her first probably as barbara mother of sean in sean of the dead what no downton abbey no it's sean of the dead is the first one they think of i, I the first thing i think of is downton abbey no it's it's sean of the De- <laughs> i haven't watched that but you're probably right she's also in both best exotic marigold hotel films and spielberg's the bfg as the queen Joanna Joseph played Lizzie. She was Cap Child in Quartermass Conclusion and Irma in The Remains of the Day. Jude Alderson played Red-Haired Prostitute. She was also a prostitute in Outland, and she's Ma Vicious in Sid and Nancy. I think that's everything for the French Lieutenant's Woman. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Letterboxd, where, as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. We also have a Discord. You can join the 24-7 movie chat and share your thoughts on episodes past, present, and future at VintageVideoPodcast.com slash Discord. And if you're listening on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Raggedy Man, which IMDb describes like so. A divorcee with two sons has an affair with a young sailor passing through her Texas town in 1944. We leave you now with a trailer for Raggedy Man. And daughter, working for On the Oscar night, Dalla. she was the toast of the nation. Now, she's the talk of the town. Academy Award winner Sissy Spacek is Nita Longley. The eyes of Gregory, Texas are upon her. Situation. I'm a, a divorced woman. What's going on, Nita? Nobody's on Easy Street. Oh, yes, sir. I know that, but I've got two fine young boys to think about. She's a divorced woman, aren't she? She ain't got nobody. Would you like a cup of coffee? Maybe the rain will slow down out there for a minute. What's a little water to a sailor, anyway? Let me get you a No. No, it's just the way I like it. You know, today sure has been fun for me. For the boys, too. They're in hog heaven. It was my understanding that uh, you had a young friend over here, Sailor, I believe. People do talk, Mrs. Longley. And what do they say? An experienced woman like yourself. You mean a divorced woman? A divorced woman like yourself has got no business with some young boy over here. It's nobody's business what I do. This town doesn't own me. I thought you weren't supposed to have no visitors over there. What's the matter? There's a young man in there. I can't make it work. I want you to love Terry. I still got one more day, Terry. No, I want you to go on and go. This doesn't work for us. I'm sorry. God, I feel so... so caught. Tonight? Yeah, tonight. What the hell? We can't put it on forever. She has so much to fight for. And so many to fight. Academy Award winner Sissy Spacek is Nita Longley. Raggedy Man.